Funding for Impressions of California has been provided by the Joan Irvine Smith and Athlete R. Clark Foundation, Fieldstead and Company, the Fieldstone Foundation, the Arduous Foundation, and Friends of the Artists. Pacific International Exposition of 1915 was a stunning achievement for the city of San Francisco. Organized to celebrate the completion of the Panama Canal, the huge event also provided dramatic evidence of the city's rebirth from the ashes and rubble of the devastating 1906 San Francisco earthquake. The Panama Pacific Exposition was an equally historic event for the art community in Northern California. There was a massive exhibition of European and American art at the fair, and it showcased the work of many famous Impressionists, including Child Hossam, who also visited the area and painted there. At the time of the fair, Impressionism was well established in Southern California, but it hadn't yet caught on in the San Francisco Bay Area, where tonalism still dominated the art scene. For many northern artists, accustomed to the muted grays and browns of the tonalist style, seeing so much brilliant color was deeply affecting. No artists were more excited by the Impressionists' use of color than a small group of East Bay landscape painters who would soon make their mark as the Society of Six. French Impressionism by that time was over 40 years old, but it came like a bolt from the blue that freed the six to a new way of seeing, just as it had freed so many others before them. Nancy Boas is an art historian who is an authority on the Society of Six. She recalls the impact of Impressionism on Selden Connor Guile, the group's leader and driving force. As soon as Selden Guile saw the works of the Impressionists at the fair, he abandoned the gray tonalist painting that he had been looking at before and entered the world of color. Selden Guile and other members of the Society of Six lived and painted in the Oakland area, and they worked together from the time of the fair throughout most of the 1920s. In addition to a common love of color, the six artists shared an enthusiasm for a spontaneous, direct approach to painting that one of the members, William Clapp, tried to capture in a manifesto he wrote for the group. Clapp said in, in his manifesto for the six, to us, seeing is the greatest joy of existence, and we try to express that joy. William Clapp expressed his sense of joy in a style that owed much to French Impressionism. The other members of the group were considerably more experimental, however, and they soon moved beyond Impressionism into new artistic territory. This evolution was stimulated in part by their exposure to modern French painting, and particularly to a group of artists known as the Fauves. The Fauves, as seen in this painting by George Brock, used color so subjectively and expressively that it became almost a language unto itself. The members of the Society of Six were greatly excited by this uninhibited use of color. Their general attitude at the time is remembered by Paul Carey, an artist who painted with Selden Guile, Maurice Logan, and other members of the group. Well, a characteristic of that group and uh, of others at that time, too, was uh, freedom. Uh, they wanted to break completely away from their ancestors in the earlier periods. Everybody wanted to do their own thing. Like other artists of the turbulent 1920s, the members of the Society of Six 
sought a heightened expressiveness in their work. Thus, while they drew inspiration from the California landscape, they depicted that landscape in a highly subjective manner that often communicates more about their emotions and the act of painting than about the landscape itself. And in this, they joined the modern painters whose idea was to make a mark on the canvas to show the hand of the artist in the work. Despite their common interests, the six artists were nevertheless quite distinctive in their styles. August Gay, for example, was as interested in design as he was in color. And in his work, he often delighted in arranging geometric forms on the flat surface of the canvas. The most experimental and eccentric member of the group was undoubtedly Bernard von Eichmann, or Red as he was known. While working as a sailor in the Merchant Marine, von Eichmann had an opportunity to travel widely, and he absorbed the latest art wherever he went. His vivid and highly original artistic vision is evident in works such as this street scene he painted while in China. He was extremely forward-looking in his painting, and he was one of the most abstract painters in Northern California in the 1920s. Other members of the group, including Louis Segrist, were intrigued by von Eichmann's colorful personality, and they found him a compelling subject for their art. And you can see in the portrait that Segrist painted of von Eichmann, his fascination with that fiery character called Red. It is a note of historical irony that while the work of the Society of Six was widely criticized at the time, it actually anticipates the abstract expressionism that later swept the American art world. Well, the Six were quite shocking. Their work in its time was disdained for being rough and unfinished and raw. And those characteristics are the kind of characteristics which after World War II came to be regarded as particularly American. And therefore I think they were very forward-looking and it was a equality which they pioneered. During the 1920s, while the members of the Society of Six were busy at work in Oakland, other progressive artists were exploring new directions across the bay in San Francisco. Many of the San Francisco progressives, and especially those who gathered at the Gallery Beaux-Arts, were greatly influenced by the pioneering French painter, Paul Cézanne, who had helped revolutionize European art in the latter part of the 19th century. In paintings such as this one, Cézanne envisioned the landscape in a manner that was radical for his time, liberating color, line, and shape from their context in nature and utilizing them as independent elements of expression. By using color and line for expressive rather than merely descriptive purposes, he moved into a new realm of art, one that is sometimes called post-impressionism. And once you liberated line and color so that a pure red could sing all on its own, or a jagged line could say something tense and anxious, then you have what I think we classically call post-impressionist thinking. Wanda Korn, who is an art historian at Stanford University, describes the impact of post-impressionist thinking on landscape art. Post-impressionism introduced subjectivity in art. It introduced self-expression in art. It suggested that you could still paint the landscape, but you had to inject that with some kind of psychology. California artists of the 1920s who were attracted to this more psychological or subjective approach to painting are often called progressive artists. A good example is Anne Bremer, a leading figure in the San Francisco art community who studied post-impressionism firsthand in France. Bremer was also important as an early champion of both women's and artists' rights in California. Like artists before her, she was strongly oriented toward the California landscape, but in expressing her personal vision of the land, she employed a variety of post-impressionist devices, including flattening of perspective and decorative patterning. 
She was one of the first painters to understand post-impressionism. And a, a painting that attracted attention at the Panama Pacific International Exposition and may be looked on as quite influential and exceedingly colorful is called An Old Fashioned Garden. It is a tapestry of colors and it's more of a construct than it is a representation of nature. Other San Francisco artists who depicted physical objects from a more psychological point of view included Gertrude Partington Albright, whose paintings of the California landscape often feature intense colors and vigorous brushwork. And also Otis Oldfield, another Northern California artist who had experienced modern French art while living and working in Paris. Progressive ideas also animate the work of Helen Forbes, who approached her subjects from the perspective of structure and design. In this highly stylized depiction of Death Valley, for example, Forbes emphasizes the folds of the earth, much as she accentuates the folds of the tablecloth in a still life titled The Bouquet. One of the best known of the progressive artists in San Francisco in the 1920s was Maynard Dixon, who became famous for his powerful evocations of the American West. Dixon was also something of a legend in his own time. His complex and enigmatic character is recalled by his biographer, Donald Haggerty. Maynard Dixon was an extraordinarily complex individual. He had many sort of personas. He was uh, intellectual, cosmopolitan, bohemian in the life of San Francisco, a poet, a writer, but he would spend an uh, inordinate amount of time out in the desert. He loved to camp by himself, paint by himself, but he would return to San Francisco because he needed the city and he needed the city's culture. Dixon felt a strong identification with the American West, both in terms of its native peoples and its vast and timeless spaces. His deep feelings for the West are remembered by his son, Daniel Dixon. And when he lost himself in the West, he went as a pilgrim. It must have been some quest for eternity, something that is deathless and timeless and that won't change as a result of fads or vogues or human eccentricity that endures. If Maynard Dixon felt split between his needs as an urban intellectual and a desert pilgrim, he also found himself torn as a landscape painter. Dixon's dilemma, like that of many other California artists in the 1920s, was how to utilize modern ideas while remaining faithful to the objective facts of the Western landscape, a landscape he greatly revered. Dixon's solution was to minimize naturalistic detail and to gain greater expressiveness by accentuating the structure and rhythms of the land. Thus he favored landscape scenes in which structural elements were dominant. He once said that the austere lands define my art and what he meant by austere lands is the lack of detail, the clarity, uh, no trees obscuring the landscapes, the, the sort of very basic feeling for shape and form that he found in the desert. Like their counterparts in San Francisco, the Monterey artists who belonged to the progressive Monterey group were exploring new directions during the 1920s. Several of these artists lived in the historic Stevenson Adobe, which became an important center of bohemian activity on the Monterey Peninsula. Among the residents of Stevenson House were the Bruton sisters, Margaret, Helen, and Esther, who were engaged in a variety of creative pursuits. In a painting from about 1920, Margaret Bruton captures her sister Helen at a quiet moment in her studio. While in this Monterey landscape, she combines her enthusiasm for architectural forms with a visceral response to the dramatic clouds massing above the town. Another important resident of Stevenson House was August Gay, a member of the Society of Six who moved to Monterey in 1919. 
Gay made several paintings of the adobe, including this view, which demonstrates his strong feeling for geometry and color. Gay was influenced not only by modern French art, but also by the explosive power and darker undercurrents of German Expressionism, which are reflected in this forceful painting of a building in Monterey. August Gay was a good friend of Clayton Seymour Price, another prominent artist who lived at the Stevenson Adobe. Price's work of the 1920s has much in common with that of Gay and other members of the Society of Six, particularly in its rawness and directness. As he said, you have to feel it like, almost like pitching hay. He wanted to go directly from feeling to the canvas, and I think it shows. C.S. Price understood much about modernism and was prepared to move further into abstraction than most of his colleagues. As he painted the landscape, he became less and less concerned with objective physical characteristics and instead sought to convey the deeper processes of nature. He was a very important force for modernism. He claimed as his subject matter the relationship of man and nature. And eventually, he went even beyond nature and looked for the relationship of man to the universe. The career of another Monterey artist, Francis McComas, reveals much about the shifting currents of art in California in the early part of the 20th century. At one time, a tonalist painter who favored muted colors and soft forms McComas later moved in a modernist direction. This painting of a cypress tree with its bold, simplified design and flat construction expresses a modern vision of the Monterey landscape. As California's artistic landscape became increasingly diverse, artists could be seen moving in many new directions. In the case of Jesse Arms Botke, another painter active in Monterey during the 1920s. That meant taking a strongly decorative approach to her subjects. Jesse Arms Botke was a very unique individual. She had her own category as America's foremost decorative painter of birds. Art historian Patricia Trenton, who is an authority on Jesse Botke, notes that Botke drew inspiration from multiple sources, including European tapestries and Japanese screens. And while her paintings of exotic birds set against backgrounds of gold leaf are unique, they bear a distinct relationship to the Art Deco style. I saw some progression in her art using modern principles, in other words, enlarging forms, flattening them more so. And we think about it in the 20s, it was a very strongly decorative period with Art Deco. And I think her gold reflects the Art Deco style strongly. The decade of the 1920s also proved to be a time of change in Southern California, where rapid economic development was paralleled by a quickening pace in the arts. As in Northern California, a growing number of artists were attracted to post-impressionist ideas. The very first person to arrive who could be considered a post-impressionist was probably Helena Dunlap, and actually she came around 1911. According to art historian Nancy Moray, Helena Dunlap found herself outside the mainstream of art in Los Angeles. Her work, such as this painting of an Arab cafe in North Africa, was considered bold at the time. In need of camaraderie and support, Dunlap joined together with other progressive artists, such as Henrietta Shore. In 1916, they formed a group called the Modernists. This is a typical situation where artists who, whose work is a little too avant-garde to be accepted find themselves isolated from the mainstream and having to band together. The group was called the Los Angeles Modern Art Society and it included Herbert and Maida Cressy, a husband and wife who painted in a similar progressive style. Maida Cressy's work is distinguished by energetic brushwork and an expressive use of color, while Bert Cressy's work, such as this painting of La Jolla Cove, 
from about 1918, often features heightened color effects, reminiscent of the French Fauve painters. Although they were not Impressionists, the Cressys frequently interpreted a subject popular with Impressionist painters. Quiet figures relaxing in beautiful garden settings. Idyllic in tone, such scenes also reflect the casual outdoor lifestyle that was highly valued in Southern California at the time. Another Los Angeles artist, Donna Schuster, was also drawn to this idyllic subject matter. At the same time, her work is highly diverse and it reveals the multiple currents affecting California artists during the first quarter of the 20th century. Early in her career, Schuster received instruction from Edmund Tarbell in Boston, and her paintings from that period, including this self-portrait, show Tarbell's influence. She subsequently studied with the noted Impressionist William Merritt Chase, and for several years thereafter, she painted in a high-keyed, impressionistic style. Donna Schuster was always an explorer, however, and she became increasingly interested in modern developments in art. Soon her work began to reflect post-impressionist ideas, including flattening of perspective and a heightened emphasis on design. Donna Schuster aligned herself with a more progressive group of artists like Helena Dunlap. She was a member of the progressive group of eight. Another Los Angeles artist who belonged to the group of eight was Mabel Alvarez, seen here in a striking self-portrait from 1923. Alvarez, who was known for strong but harmonious use of color, often placed realistically rendered figures against highly stylized backgrounds. Edward Wiesikl, an immigrant from Czechoslovakia, was also a member of the group of eight. While he was at one point interested in light and color from an Impressionist perspective, he too moved in a progressive direction in the 1920s. His strongly modernist portrait of the Herwig family is described by John Stern, the executive director of the Irvine Museum. It is a nearly cubist approach to representing a family portrait with the image shattered and put together again. A very astute and a very advanced style of painting for Los Angeles at the time. One of the most forward-looking members of the Group of Eight was Clarence Hinkle. In the view of cultural historian Bram Dykstra, Hinkle's experimental outlook also reveals much about the Los Angeles art community at the time. In the 1920s, the, uh, the lines, the demarcation lines between various styles were much more fluid than we perceive them to be now. Artists uh, moved from, from one style to another, they experimented, and you see that uh, quite a bit in a number of painters, in particular uh, painters such as uh, Clarence Hinkle and Thomas Hunt. Like the members of the Society of Six in Northern California, Hinkle loved the physical act of painting, and he believed that the application of paint to canvas was itself a vital force for expression. In the, the work of Clarence Hinkle, the, the brush strokes uh, come and build up entire landscapes after a while. You see um, the brush strokes as brush strokes pronouncing themselves as a landscape when you move away from them. Clarence Hinkle continued to refer to the California landscape, but he did so in a way that conveyed his unique vision and style as an artist. What you find in, in someone like Hinkle is the, the blurring of uh, style and content. Style does become content for Hinkle, but the content still maintains itself. Another Southern California artist, Thomas Hunt, also painted in a highly energetic and gestural manner. Hunt's work stands out for its simplified forms and for the way in which it often moves toward abstraction, a tendency which can be seen in this painting of a grape arbor. Of the progressive artists active in Southern California in the 1920s, one of the most original was Conrad Buff. 
Boff's boldly conceived paintings reveal a unique vision of the Western landscape, a vision that, in the view of his daughter-in-law, Libby Buff, defies easy categorization. Critics found it difficult to pigeonhole him because he didn't go along with just whatever happened to be fashionable, and he really didn't care about whether they could pigeonhole him or not. Conrad Buff was a good friend of Maynard Dixon, and he shared Dixon's love of the vast spaces and austere beauty of the American West. Like Dixon, Buff had a deep reverence for nature, but he was also well aware of its raw and often daunting power, a power that animates much of his work. So he didn't over-sentimentalize the qualities in nature. The power of the landscape came across to him intensely. That's what he wanted to show. That's what he wanted to convey. Progressive artists working in California during the 1920s moved beyond Impressionism, but they generally stopped short of becoming true modernists. Instead, they sought to incorporate modern ideas into their depictions of traditional subjects, particularly the Western landscape, which provided them with a wealth of inspiration and imagery. But if these artists continued to portray the objective world, they did so from a decidedly subjective point of view. In their efforts to reconcile inner and outer realities, to honor both nature and the psyche, they explored much vital territory, and they greatly enriched the artistic dialogue in California during the 1920s. Funding for Impressions of California has been provided by the Joan Irvine Smith and Athelie R. Clark Foundation, Fieldstead and Company, the Fieldstone Foundation, the Arduous Foundation, and Friends of the Artists.